So welcome to A Feast of Words, our annual event for the Friends of the Lo University of Minnesota Libraries and members of the Campus Club. I'm so glad that you could join us this evening. I'm Lisa German, I'm the um, Dean of Libraries, and I think I've gotten to talk to most of you this evening. Thank you so much for coming. Um, each year at this event, we get to shine a light on the impressive and impactful scholarly work um, conducted by the University of Minnesota's faculty members. A sampling of past presenters include Mike Dockery, John Wright, Ann Waltner, Erica Lee, Brenda Child, Carl Fink, Anatoly Lieberman, and many more. Our speaker for tonight's A Feast of Words is Dr. Keith Mays. Dr. Mays is an associate professor in the College of Liberal Arts here at the University of Minnesota. He is also a Horace T. Morse alumni, distinguished teaching professor, director of the Center of Race, um, Indigeneity, Disability, Gender and Sexuality Studies, and, and the associate dean in the Office of Undergraduate Education for DEI initiatives. The title of his presentation is Pursuing Diagnosis, Academic Underachievement and the Racialization of Special Education in the Public Schools. It relates to his 2023 book, The Unteachables, Disability Rights and the Invention of Black Special Education. Dr. Mays is also the author of Kwanzaa, Black Power, and the Making of African American Holiday Tradition. We are thrilled and grateful and privileged, and I'm honored, to um, have him with us here tonight. Before we hear from Dr. Mays, however, I'd like to acknowledge the peoples upon whose land we meet. The University of Minnesota, Twin Cities, is built within the tra traditional homelands of the Dakota people. It's important for us to acknowledge the peoples on whose land we live, learn, and work as we seek to improve and strengthen our relations with tribal nations. We also acknowledge that words are not enough. We must ensure that our institution provides support, resources, and programs that increase access to all aspects of higher education for American Indian students, staff, faculty, and community members. And now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Keith Mays. Good evening, and thank you so much to Lisa German and Mark Ingerbretson and the entire University Libraries, Libraries team for inviting me. And Mark, uh, thank you for being patient. I'm not the most responsive when it comes to email returns. <laughs> and so I know Mark, Mark uh, probably, I wonder, why the, why the hell did we, did we invite this guy to speak? <laughs> But it is truly, I was telling folks at the table, it truly is, um, it's difficult to uh, really juggle an academic career with an administrative one. Um, we, we, I tell people all the time, we do have three responsibilities, teaching, research, and service, and you know, whomever came up with that. Uh, as, a, as a series of responsibilities for a faculty, they were wrong for doing that. <laughs> Uh, and or I'm, I'm crazy to try to attempt all three at the same time. But I'm so so glad to be here. And I think that um, and I tell people this too that I'm probably I had to rank them in order: research, teaching, and administrative. I would uh, rank research for me as a ten, although it's the hardest for me to. To actually do, it's hard to write articles and and produce books, and teaching is a passion, is a love for mine, and I would rank it a nine. And administrative, I, I enjoy the least. I, I don't hate it. I would put it at a seven. It's just not the passion that knowledge production is, and so it was really a thrill for me to com finally complete the book after ten years of working on it. 
so thank, thanks a lot. <laughs> um, and then I um, uh, decided that, uh, how many more of these are going to do in a career? <laughs> but I, I, I'm working on the next one already and think I can do it better and smarter and faster. Uh, so, so thank you guys for that. So the, the title of the talk tonight is Pursuing Diagnosis. And the reason why I chose that title is because I, I believe that psychologists, particularly educational psychologists, pursued diagnosis when they created uh, this discourse uh, around educational disability. But that title really is tied to the next iteration of The Unteachables, which is a book on black uh, student behavior. And I'm looking more uh, at how um, not educational psychologists created discourses around black disability, but how clinical psychologists created a discourse around so-called bad black behavior. But I think the two projects are really close together. So the next book that comes out of my chapter five on EBD, uh, but EBD, uh, and I'll talk about this a little bit in a second, uh, ends up being a milder form of, of black comportment uh, and some of the more egregious forms are what ends up uh, on the DSM. And what ends up on the DSM is not necessarily uh, what young black youth act out. It's a function of how clinical psychiatrists understand uh, black youth behavior. So that's uh, the next project, but you know, I'll speak to a little bit of that uh, toward the middle of the presentation. And certainly this book is about uh, academic underachievement and the racialization of that particular discourse. So I want to start off by saying that unteachable, it's not a label to attribute to a child, but unteachability is an analytic, which is to say it's a careful and systematic study of how adults characterize student performance, behavior, achievement, learning potential, or the lack thereof. An analytic is the study of language and concepts. And I talk about unteachability being uh, the ethos of inclusion and exclusion. So I use this whole dichotomy of inclusion and exclusion to talk about the birth of special education, education because what, what much of that commentary is about in the early 20th century is about who is not in, who's not supposed to be in general education. I'll say more about that in a second. Unteachability is based on the idea and the practice of sorting and removing. Uh, this analytic describes all manifestations of unteachability in the system of education. And unteachability, teachability exist along a, a continuum. I won't talk more about that today. I talk more about that in a lot of the professional development that I do, but um, if I have time to te uh, tease that out, I, I will. But I do want to start here and talk about why it's important to historicize disability in special education. In order for anyone to do that, they really have to talk about the long history of objectionable terms. Terms that we use today as caricatures, as ways to insult people, but I want to talk about uh, how these words uh, were used to describe real people in the, at the dawning of the 20, 20th century. So I say in the beginning of the book, I have to uh, write this note on terminology, and it's important for any reader who put, picks up the book to understand why these terms are being used in the book uh, as a trained historian. and. Even if someone who's not a historian, anyone who is, wants to engage in the exercise of historicizing uh, special education starting from the beginning of the system, they have to really take on these words. Uh, and so you see them here. Uh, and as I say at the end, 
Uh, we chart how ideas of racial difference shape objectionable terminology, harmful labels, and suspicious designations of disability. The question becomes, why are these labels suspicious? What makes them suspicious? When we use words like moron and imbecile and idiot. And as I talked about this book, and I should say this because I think it's important for me to say, especially as someone who's a historian of grassroots movements, somebody who uh, studies organizations and ordinary people who um, are about engaging in certain activities for social change, and as a historian of the 1960s and the 1970s, um, I became fascinated with this topic because racial disproportionality, when I uh, began to encounter it, I thought it was an early 21st century, late 20th century, early 21st century phenomenon. But as a, a historian of the 1960s, I said, let me look into this. And it, it must start there in the 1960s because of the Brown decision and what it unleashed. And that is a kind of an origin story, not uh, the main one. When I began to do more research, I realized that racial disproportionality, as we have come to understand it, and, and, and as, a, as a grand ch challenge of our time, I realized that racial disproportionality began when the system of special education was created in 1900. It starts then. So when I talk about suspicious designations of disability, one has to start when the system was first created. So I came across this quote by Du Bois in 1920. He said, then came psychology. The children of the public schools were studied, and it was discovered that some children, colored children, ranked lower than white children. And I began to read that over and over again and analyze it and thought that there obviously was something odd about it. Du Bois is writing in the, in the parlance of the times. And so uh, I love verbs. So I looked at those verbs closely. I said, Du Bois said that they were studied and then it was discovered. I said, Du Bois would not say that today. I said, what would Du Bois say if he was writing a book like this? I said, I'm going to make Du Bois say what I would say. <laughs> so I said that um, psychology did not study and discover. Psychology invented and then assembled black inferiority. That's where we are in the 21st century. Um, if I lived in the time of the, of, of the early Du Bois in the 20th century, I would have used uh, studied and discovered. But I think invention and, and assembling, assembling describes the history of special education. And why would I say that? Because I was struck by the history of a compulsory education and how it basically demanded that children who were not in public schools regularly, why these laws across states, these are state, state laws, why they would compel families to send their children to school. This is the industrial age. Uh, this is the age of efficiency. Uh, the economy is growing in ways that it needs uh, an educated workforce, uh, not the kind of educated workforce that we have come to think about in the late 20th century, early 20th century, not a college educated workforce, although uh, those folks were valued, but they need folks who, who at least can achieve a high school diploma. And so we need folks to go to school uh, uh, early and stay, stay in school and graduate or uh, receive a modicum of skills that would uh, work uh, in the industrial economy. But these laws, I, when I was reading the documents by special educators, superintendents, and others, they didn't like compulsory attendance laws, right? People like Edgar Dahl and others said that, why, why are we forcing kids to go to school? And so why, I was like, why would they critique compulsory attendance laws? Well, they just told you what they thought about them. Attendance policies that required the mass schooling of children uh, compulsory education was criticized because it tried to teach everything to everyone, sending all children to school regardless of their mental limitations. 
Dahl was the leader of a school called the Vineland School in New Jersey. He said the public school with its program of mass instruction faces the impossible task of giving impartial attention to the most heterogeneous aggregation of different social and intellectual classes that could possibly be imagined in a common gathering. These, this kind of language on and on and on that many of these folks uh, would, would say openly and outwardly. And what I realized was that general education was the special purview of m white middle class and wealthy families. That's where their kids went to school. And the folks who were not in school were those who were marginalized, marginalized by race and class. So that meant black and brown students and poor white students, mainly white students of uh, immigrant families. They were, uh, they, if they attended schools, they attended schools very sporadically. But general education uh, was the purview of more privileged families. So they went on and s to say that if compulsory education insisted that all children must attend school, special education appeared to differentiate and court them off inside schools. To guard against the interests of white middle class students, school superintendents worked to safeguard their well-being with the creation of what they called back then special classes. So this is before disability. This is before uh, designations of disability as we know it today. And I'll, I'll talk to you how this starts uh, in um, the early 1900s. But uh, we need to create a separate system for these kids who are coming into the system in masses, in droves. Uh, and we need to have, have some place for them uh, to go. So why special classes? Special classes contain student populations rather than function as an intervention to help students with disabilities. And so, when, you know, again, if you queried them at the time, they would just tell you uh, straight up, uh, this is about protecting the rights of the more capable children. That more, the, the children who were understood to be capable were children that they were deemed normal. So I spent a lot of time in the book describing what normal meant because they talked about normal students being the so-called torchbearers of American de democracy, and they decried something that they call subnormality, right? Students who were subnormal. And subnormal had a particular kind of definition to it. So when, it, when I realized that uh, this was a class-based system, special education also is a gender-based gender system, but certainly, uh, not too many people talked about special education as a race-based system. You get conversations about special education and race when disproportionality becomes apparent in the 1970s and 1980s. But as I argued in the book, that race is at the center of the story in the early 1900s. So I say on my page five, I said, Carving out privileged white spaces in each of these classifications, however, did not hold up for long. White student protection and advancement required the segregation of low-performing and unruly, that's the behavior piece, unruly black children in a separate system. This separate race-based system with its accompanied disability discourses created the foundation for, a black, for black disproportional placement in special education. So I said the pages that follow this is provocative. I love to create provocation in my prose. And like I said, she's going to give me all the reviews on the book, which have been good, I think. But there are some people, you know, say they're going to hate on the book. I had a couple of people who are in, special, in the field of special education that said, Keith, they said, I'm in this listserv. And they heard about your book. They pissed off. I said, who, who are they? They said, Ed Psych people, that like special education people. <laughs> I said, well, I'm a historian. Uh, I understand that they may be uh, upset a little bit, but it's my job to, to historicize. So this is what I said as a major, as a major part of my argument. Uh, the pages that follow historicize how race shaped ideas about disability, and then in turn how disability shaped ideas about race in a reinscribing feedback loop. Black students were not placed in special education because they were incontrovertibly disabled they were placed there because they were incontrovertibly black. 
Far from being undeniably disabled, placement practices consign black students to a resegregation scheme under the auspices of special education. I just went there only because the sources just told me to do it because it, it, these sources screamed out that, you know, hey, listen, it was like tapping me on the shoulder, Edgar Dahl and all these, it's like, and superintendents back in the early 20s, hey, hey Keith Mays, this is what we did. We're right about it. Tell that story. And this is a quote I want to read. I want you guys just to look at it real quick. But this is how they thought about normal, so-called normal and subnormal children. And even <laughs> in the early days of special education, they thought there was too much attention being paid on students who were marginalized coming into the system for the first time. Questioning, like, why are we doing this? Why are we spending all these resources on these students? Um, and, and it said, um, the most that could be done uh, is to render them in some measure self-supporting, perhaps the ultimate solution of their problem should to be treat them as wards of the state. You know, again, this, this notion that they don't belong in this space called general education. And special education seems to be capturing the attention of many people who um, undoubtedly would like, who would love to help children who may not have uh, all of the resources. And so this is when I talked about this notion of focusing on those who are more privileged, this is what I mean. Obligations to the normal child. Okay. So, so I, in the book called Special Education, an early version of risk management, uh, special education emerged to prohibit students of color and to a lesser degree children of white foreign born parents from accessing general education classes. Indeed, the concept of educational risk has been misunderstood. Students of color were not at risk, but exhibited perceived risk to middle class white parents who wished for their children to learn and race in class segregated environments. The question I have for you, and you don't have to answer it, is that, is this still true? that there are those who wish their children to be separated based on race and class. So the question for me was, who's at risk and what does that mean? I turned that around and said that the folks who are at risk are the children who are privileged. They are, pri they are at risk of losing their privilege with the influx of those who have less pri privilege coming into the system. But again, education has this tendency to turn things around and say that the, the folks who, are, who hold the risk are the, are the folks who um, have all the margins, carry all the marginality. So who is normal? The normal, normal means the absence of pathological symptoms. Again, the ed psych folks, so, psych, so ed psych, like all uh, subfields in education, are rooted in a certain kind of scientific understanding. And they may look at medicine, the field of medicine, to uh, allow that field to inform how they uh, develop their own discourses and practices. So sy 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 systems of pathology are characterized by the biological symptoms of disease. This is Mercer, who wrote a great book in the 1970s on uh, mental retardation, intellectual disability. But here's the thing, the statistical normal is the concept of the normal curve of the frequency distribution. It defines abnormality according to the extent to which individuals vary from the age of the population on a particular trait. So the question of who is normal in the medical model means the absence of organic disease. Sick children under that model are few and far between. The normal conception and ed psych means that if you fall below the average or the mean, you are deemed statistically sick. So on a psychometric test, anything that is one or two standard deviations below the mean, according to the ed psych folk, you were subnormal, you were abnormal, you were sick. Under that model, I argue that millions of children could be rendered sick after scoring below a certain range. 
that range was mainly 75, 70, 75. I'll talk about learning disability, reading dis disabled children. The, the mean may be um, 80, 85, or even it could be 110, 115, 120. You can still be learning disabled and have an IQ over 100. But for intellectual disability, it was two standard deviations below. So that meant that many children would enter the system uh, being labeled intellectually disabled because of the new psychometric understanding of who was well, who wasn't. So who's well, who's sick, who's capable, who's incapable, who's white, black, brown, who's middle class, who's poor, who's deserving, who's undeserving, who is able body and mind, who is disabled, and who belongs in general education. And those who don't belong in gen ed, they should go to special ed. This is how they mapped it out, straight up. This is the dichotomy that they created back in the early 1900s. And the question is, do we still live with this dichotomy? So as I said before, at risk or pose risk, risk to whom? The historical question is not how educators and psychologists identify difference. I understood difference and risk to be the same thing, but how is difference imposed on children and used against them as they enter the school? How did educators, ed educators and psychologists construct it? Who determined that uh, risk mattered? Why did we have to label the risk? So as I told you before, white middle-class children, how many months did they attend school? Nine. How many days a week? Five. How many hours a day? Six. Here comes compulsory education, pushing all these children in the system. How many months did black and brown and poor white kids go to school? Four. How many days a week? Two. How many hours? Two, three, four. If most kids started first grade at six years old, when did they start, start school? Many of them. Eight, nine. So this is what the system is dealing with. You're dealing with a group of people who do not have the luxury of attending schools regularly. So here's the question I have for you. If they enter the system that way, why do they have to be labeled at all? Why are they not attending schools? First of all, where, where, where may they be if they can't attend schools nine months out of the year, five days a week, six hours a day? What are they doing? Working. Where? Fields. Factories. At home. Part of a family economy, right? So the question becomes, these are the children who will come into the system that we would administer, as they call it back then, a Binet test. And then that, the results of that Binet test would determine if they were retarded or not. So the conceptions back then, and I want to talk about the power of labels in a minute, but I want to get to this slide because I think it was interesting. I kept seeing mental retardation, mental retardation. I'm like, what the hell is that? Okay, it's rooted in science, Keith. Okay, so I thought, when I went there, I said, okay, I expect to find this elaborate definition of retardation. It don't mean a damn thing, only that. They're only two grades behind. That's all it meant. So they did call, before they said mental retardation, they said they were age retarded or grade retarded, right? That meant that when they were given that test, the results showed that they may have been one, two, three grades behind their white so-called normal counterparts. So that was the evidence that they were sick, that they were, you know, undeserving. Psychologists come along and say that that sickness, the evidence for it on the test is not just not about what? That moment in time that they took that test and may not have done well, it's emblematic of what about that black, brown, poor white kid? Say it again. Inferiority. inferiority. And that inferiority may be based on what? 
genetics and heredity. So then mental retardation becomes something that's understood to be something that's in the gene pool, passed down from generation to generation, and that's why we will develop a separate system with a special curriculum for kids who they that, that they deem undeserving, right? So then disability, again, when I said it, it's not something that is has been formed yet, we don't necessarily have language to describe who these kids may be, but we are going to develop it uh, right away. And I was telling uh, uh, Michael earlier that the, the history of special education discourses uh, can't be talked about without uh, really going deeply into the history of measurement, but I don't talk about measurement. Maybe I should write a history of measurements, Michael. <laughs> you got a party, that's right. So, because uh, that's a whole nother field that is, you know, that's going to take you somewhere else, and it's really complex to understand uh, measurements in any way. But they were able to do this right away because of the emergence of psychometrics. And so what they did was they created, kind of used old categories that were around, idiot, imbecile, moron was also old, but uh, the reason why moron becomes, and I use, uh, there's a, a section in chapter one uh, that I call the making of the moron, because morons were understood to be two standard deviations below the mean. So if they looked at you medically, you didn't have anything wrong with you. I still had to render you sick because of the Binet test, you were understood to be a moron. Here's the thing about the moron. The moron would become the educable, mentally retarded, EMR in mid 20th century, and it would become your intellectually disabled today. So it's still the same concept, it's still around, they just change the words. And you can see the same thing with uh, phrases like culturally deprived and educationally disadvantaged. Those are described mainly black, brown, and poor white folks, but mainly black and brown in big cities. Uh, learning disabled, mainly white in the 50s and 60s, is going to turn black and brown in the 70s, late 70s, early 80s. I'll talk about that uh, later. But they were understood to be borderline, or brain injured, dullard. And then EBD, ED, emotional disturbance, was its own category. BD, behavior disorder, was a separate category. They get merged later in the 20th century. And I'll just touch on that a little bit because social maladjustment and juvenile delinquency informs our understanding of EBD because they are coming out of the same, they're grown off of the same tree. So here's the thing that's so interesting about it as I just described. From moron intellectually and or mildly retarded to intellectually disabled. So in 1917, Walter Fernall, superintendent of the Faribault School in Minnesota. So here's the thing about these separate schools, training schools, all states had them. If you were an idiot or an imbecile, and I should say idiot on the psychometric uh, scale, zero to 25, imbecile was 26 to 50, moron was around 50 to 75. So if you were an idiot or an imbecile, you couldn't go to public schools mainly, you went to these separate schools like in Faribault. They used to call that school, I have a photo here and I'll come back to it, feeble for the feeble-minded. It's called the School for the Deaf and Blind today. Uh, it's on 35, 35, 69, 169, 35, 35, 35 East South. Yeah, 35, 35 South. They merge, right, right, somewhere down there. <laughs> but now let me ask you this, where did the morons go to school? General ed schools, city schools. That's where they went. Because they were not, what? They were sick, but they were not, what kind of sick? And it doesn't mean that they didn't have sensory disabilities or even physical disabilities, but they were not, they were children who were obviously capable, but not as capable as, as uh, gen ed students, right? So let me just go back, and, and I want you to look at this. So he says in, 1917, he said, when we talked when we talked of the feeble minded 25 years ago, 25 years from 1917, we thought about imbeciles and idiots and not morons. When we discovered the moron, we doubled the number of feeble minded children. And I said that, there's that word again, there's that verb, discover. 
They invented the moron. There was no such thing as a moron. Um, although they made these folks into real people. Now here's the thing. This word mental retardation is in circulation in the early 20th century. So much so that when eugenics begins to fade in the 1920s and 1930s, and when um, feeble-minded categories start to move away, this is a new slide, I just have uh, new text at the bottom, same, same image. Somebody said that we should stop using the words idiot, imbecile, or moron and use the word mental retardation. That was a better term in 1950. And so the American Association for Mental Deficiency made that the official designation in the late 1950s. Because those words were objectionable, disrespectful, um, and, 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 and so mental retardation just means the same thing that the feeble-minded definitions mean, sub-average intellectual functioning. So age retarded, grade retarded, sub-average intellectual functioning is the same understanding. Now check this out. This is the next slide. On October 5th, 2010, because other words have been in circulation and there are people who are saying that words like mental re mentally retarded are what? Same thing. Disrespectful, oppressive. We need to get rid of the term. So President Obama signed Rosa's law, which re replaced in federal law the terms mental, retar mental retardation and mentally retarded with terms intellectually disability and, inter and, and individuals with an intellectual disability. Rose's Law also required that any regulation that used the old term shall be considered to be referring to the new terms. However, this change in federal law did not replace the use of these terms in state law. Sometimes states do something completely different than the feds do. As late as 2010. And then there were those who were debating, should we use intellectual disability? Should we use developmental disability? So there's a debate within the ed psych folks and even developmental folks, developmental psychologists and ed psych folks. So they, they are interchangeable in a lot of places. I bet you a dollar to a donut. In 50 years, we will say what about intellectually disabled? It's not right. We will change it again. Why will we change it again? What is it, what is it about each era that believes that we are doing what? We're doing it right, we're doing it better than the previous generation because we just changed the words or we really have made major breakthroughs in the research. Which one is it? We just changed the words. And I'm not saying that we haven't made strides in the research. I'm not, I won't say that at all, being an academic, but I would say that I think the conceptually um, who we, how we describe people using these words, that hasn't changed. We, we kind of dress it up. And intellectually disabled seems fine until we all know, all of us no longer here and then the next generation says, oh, wait a minute now. That, that doesn't seem, that doesn't, that, that feels wrong on the ears. Uh, developmentally disabled. Let's, let's try to use something else. So the same thing has been true with the history of the learning disabled, slow, slow learners, dullards, brain injured, and this was changed as well. Uh, but here's the thing I want to talk about, uh, and I don't know how much time I have, but I want to talk about the evolution of behavior categories because I think it's important for us to understand how black behavior is on a continuum. So there were students who were ED, in the 1930s and 1940s. There were folks who exhibited conduct problems, and there were folks who were engaged in juvenile delinquent behavior. Same kinds of behavior traits. So the trait psychologists, again, another, here's where clinical psychology starts to emerge, and personality psychology uh, with the likes of Allport and others would begin to figure out, okay, these are the behaviors that these students are exhibiting coming out of the mental hygiene clinics or psychopathic hospitals. We want to study them. The case history is going to be important here because the case history is going to tell us everything we need to know about children 
we need to take the information from the case histories and make symptoms and syndromes out of them. This is the beginning of uh, behavior categories writ large. But as we move into the mid 20th century, we will understand these behaviors in a different way. And I don't have time to talk about it here, but even autism, uh, an area that we revere now for so many different reasons, actually comes out of the long history of emotional disturbance. And there were lobbyists, and I'll talk about this in a second, who, and then mainly professional lobbyists and parents, would say that we no longer want our children to be classified in a certain way. And they really put pressure on the system, mainly lawmakers, to change the rules, to change the policies. And so autism goes from being something that's tied to ED, then people say it's a communication disability, and then it becomes something else uh, in the late 20th century. So that's a whole nother uh, issue. And then when you get uh, uh, dynamic um, uh, diagnostic psychology that emerged in the post-war period, 1950s, you get something called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the DSM, that will begin to take this trait uh, information and put it on um, the DSM. And there, there's wonderful, there are many wonderful essays on the history of psychopathy and how that emerges from uh, uh, sociopathy. There were people who were deemed black sociopaths in the 1950s, and they worked that out for it to become something that's legitimate in the 1980s and 1990s with antisocial personality disorder, which is on the DSM. But again, all of these, every single label that is part of any taxonomy, any classification system, one of the things that fascinates me as a historian is that they all have long histories and they start somewhere and they wind through the 20th century and much of the understanding is hidden. We don't understand the long history and certainly we, don't, we may not really know how we got here. So I just have some traits that are on the screen that describes different kinds of students. So you have person, personality problems and conduct problems and I want you guys to take a look at this and tell me, are there ways in which they could be racialized to describe certain kinds of students, right? And they were. Uh, so as you can see on the next slide, uh, folks who were understood to be externalizers uh, were mainly black and brown, and those who were internalizers were mainly white. And these traits show, they show up on different diagnostic categories uh, associated with different disability labels. And so for your externalizers, they would say stuff like, well, the, the behavior that they're engaged in is a choice that they're making. And then they would say with the folks who are internalizers, who are mainly white, well, it's kind of out of necessity. What do they mean when they use the word necessity? Say it again. Okay, so not a choice, meaning that there is something what? Within the child that has what? Gone wrong. There's some internal wiring that is not functioning properly, which makes the acting out one of necessity, whereas the folks who engage in these behaviors on the left, my, your right, my left, I'm not sure how it's showing up, making it feel as though these folks are engaged in this deliberately. And I'll talk uh, one second about how they understood black disability, disability that's not necessarily something that's coming, that's, that's something that is, that is inside the brain, as it were. They understood black disability to be part of their entire makeup of their culture. So I'll get to that in a second. So they, they sort of begin to take these traits, make symptoms and syndromes out of them. And people like Ackerman, Jenkins, Quay, Achenbach, all these folks focused on deviant behavior. And they just said the over-inhibited child were the folks who had those traits and they were personality problems. The unsocialized aggressive child were the conduct problems and the socialized delinquent child also the conduct kids as well. And Quay just broke it down to personality and conduct. 
So personality are your ED kids, a lot of white kids, and then your BD kids or your black and brown behavior disorder, those are just folks who were externalizers. So internalizers, externalizers, your personality kids, and your conduct problem kids. Then Brown v. Board happens. And Brown v. Board actually begins to speak to intellectual disability as well because they talked about the so-called rights of the handicapped. And this is where it gets really interesting because you have school districts, mainly in the South, after the Brown decision, because Brown said what? You have to destroy all your dual schools, your dual school educational system, black schools, white schools, you have to merge them and make them one school. Well, DC said, the hell with that, if we gotta do that, we're gonna make tracks inside the schools. Academic tracking had been around prior to Brown, but it becomes more pronounced after Brown because if we had to bring all the kids in the building, we have to figure out ways to keep them separate. So uh, the DC schools had the special academic track, which they called the retarded track, was mainly black kids. The gen track average was racially mixed and the college preparatory and the honors and gifted were almost all white in 56 when the tracking system in DC uh, was created. Black families, because it's the beginning of the civil rights movement, they will begin to join grassroots organizations and begin to fight back, take school districts to court and begin to sue them. And in a famous case called Hobson v. Hampson, right there, they were, a they were able to convince the judge that, um, that that was wrong. And the, and the superintendent, straight, he said it straight up in the case. He said that the, the four-track system uh, was precipitated by the Brown decision. He just said it. That's why we created it because all the students from what they call the Negro Two, the Negro Two Division schools, uh, they had to come into uh, our schools. So the Brown decision and SPED applied the language of equal educational opportunity for white so-called handicapped, mentally retarded, slow learners, minimal brain injured, but black mentally retarded learners dis disabled by poverty received separate legislation. So one of the more fascinating things that I discovered, and as part of my chapter three, was that the war on poverty, with its emphasis on helping black kids educationally, said that black special, educa black special education kids would be covered in Head Start and Title I. That's the coverage that they receive from the federal government. And that those kids had societal handicaps. Yes, they, were, they acknowledged that they did have what they call handicaps or disabilities. But they were societal ones, they were family ones, they were community handicaps. They were not necessarily intellectual ones. So you get Title I and Head Start. You don't get anything else. But the emphasis that the federal government and the movement paid to black communities upset white families. And they said that where is our educational legislation? We don't have any for our children. And so the learning disabilities movement, it begins in the 1950s and the 1960s. So I call this the educational disability rights movement, not so much a movement, but a, a rather an advocacy group of white, a privileged white parents, social scientists, educational professionals. So you see all the folks I have here on the screen, they always work together to produce new legislation. White parents, social scientists, educational professionals, special education lobbyists like the council, uh, like the CEC, and members of even Congress champion new legislation on behalf of white slow learners. Because, again, the focus seemed to be on black and brown learners with the Elementary and Secondary Education Act. So McGrady and others began to dichotomize the black slow learner and the white slow learner. And they, he wrote, the LD student is not disadvantaged. This is to say that a particular disadvantaged child may not have a learning disability. A learning disability is not the result of disadvantage per se. The learning dis disability child needs a program different from that child who is culturally deprived, who is educationally disadvantaged. And Sam Kirk, who I really center in the book because he was the main psychologist who really advocated for learning disabilities legislation, uh, he said, when you talk about 
disadvantaged children, particularly under the anti-poverty program, I think we have a little different picture than we do in the field of, of handicapped children. Greer of the CEC Council of Exceptional, Exceptional Children said, I think one of the shortcomings so far as the handicapped children are concerned with the Head Start program is that it was not planned for them. If I have understood the prevailing philosophy of that program, it has not been designed for the child who is handicapped. Because this is how they understood it. LD means unexpected and specific learning failure. EMR, education, educable mentally retarded, means expected and general failure, learning failure in black and brown kids. So what does it mean to have a specific learning failure or challenge? So they, they, <laughs> these students were scoring, again, 90, these white kids, 90, 100, 110, 120 on the IQ test, but they were failing reading and math. And the parents, their parents couldn't understand what the hell was going on. So then we need to address this. But if you have a kid, a, a black and brown kid scoring 70 on a test, is that a specific learning failure? According to the psychologists at the time, they said, no, it's not. It's part of who this black person is, this young black person, and where they may be coming from. They're coming from a failed home, a failed community, a failed environment. And so well, it's, it's expected because of who they are and where they may be coming from. So that's why we need to have separate laws. So it's not a mistake that you get the language of the Specific Learning Disabilities Act of 1965. And at the bottom, you can see what kids are not included in the law. Such terms do not include children who have learning problems, which are primarily the result of visual, hearing, or motor handicaps. We, they, so they never. So one of the things I wanted to, I, I, I sort of, this is what I post to many audiences. I said, How, why is it that sensory and physical handicaps are not overrepresented? Why, not, why is it that we don't have an overrepresentation of kids who are blind? Because you can't make that up. You can't fake that. It's, it, 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 is, it is. It is. It is what it is. But so that means that you can manipulate the others, what we call high incidence disabilities, right? So they say that it doesn't include children who are mentally retarded, of emotional disturbance, or environmentally, educationally, culturally deprived disadvantage. Can't include them. Why doesn't it not include those kids? Because they are already included in Title I. The special education, black special education kids are under Title I. So then the question becomes, how do we have a policy that segregates not only the titles, so ESA has Title I all the way up to Title Seven, Eight, and then Title I is mainly black, brown, poor kids, and then the other titles, Title VI, Title Seven, would begin to address so-called white, disabled, handicapped students, disabled students. So here's the thing that's so profound about this history. Although it appears inclusive, the policy, the legislation, and the implementation of the law allowed it to act as a sorting and removing me removal mechanism leading to the exclusion of black students from federal policy. So the big education law is the Education for All Handicapped Children Act of 1975. We just changed the name to IDEA in 1990, but it's still the same law. And it did the same thing as the Specific Learning Disabilities Act. It excluded black and brown kids who were understood to be intellectually disabled. They are not covered under the law. So three important points. Black educational disability was seen as distinct from white educational disability. Black special educational needs were already met in EOA and ESA. White parents and special educators did not believe Congress was meeting the current need of white slow learning students. They promoted the learning disabilities movement in the 1960s, leading to the SLD Act in 69. And then all hell breaks loose because this is still the late 1960s and this is the civil rights movement. So you have cautionary truth tellers who begin to say, now why are all these classes predominantly made up of Mexican Americans, Puerto Rican Americans, Black Americans in these special education class? Up to 60 to 80 percent of students taught by special educators come from low status backgrounds. 
And then the parents began, black and brown parents, begin to take the school, school districts. So Chicago unified, we taking them to court. San Francisco unified, LA unified, we taking them all to court. Because they are misclassifying our kids as intellectually disabled. So Larry P is a famous case. The Pace case is Chicago, and that case, the parents lost that one. Uh, with the desire to sort and remove again, teachers and districts then started to identify black students for specific learning disability. So how did LD become racially disproportionate? It's because of the pressure being put on districts not to classify uh, African American kids as LD. Look at this, look at these numbers. This gives you an example. So between 1976 and 1996, the number of students served as LD increased from 797,000 to 2.2. During the same period, the number of students served in EMR, as EMR decreased from 967,000 to 584,000. 60% decrease. So, as, so it's not as though they told uh, black students that they are no longer EMR. They just started to not place many of them in that category. But teachers in the classrooms said what? I don't care what you say. These kids are not they, go not, they can't stand in my classroom. They got to go somewhere. And so where do they go? They begin to go into LD classes. And that becomes dis disproportionate. Much to the consternation of people like Sam Kirk, who, who continued to say in the 1980s that the, the poor and, and, and the black student are not supposed to be covered under LD. And then racial disproportionality becomes part of the attention of the federal government, state governments, and others. And the National Research Council said in 1982, I love this statement, it says the key issue is not disproportionality per se, but rather the validity and the referral and assessment procedures and the quality of instruction received, whether in general ed or not. Now check this out. So they said, this is about uh, the administrative setting and what goes on in that setting. So they said that, well, those settings, nothing is going on. It's about the things that, uh, that should be in that setting that's not there. So they didn't take a position on who was in front of the classroom. They just said that the settings didn't have the, appro the appropriate curriculum and, and things like that. So just to fast forward a little bit, that's why we have gone from this notion of administrative settings to instructional settings because we need to stop the tide of kids going into uh, special education. So the resource room, the self-contained classroom, the special day school, the residential uh, school, the hospital, when we strip it and deconstruct it and really see what kind of interventions are in there, many people would argue that, that not much. So when they created the tier system, the tiered system being RTI first and then it's MTSS now, that we should begin to identify students who may be struggling in tier one, which is the Gen Ed classroom, and then begin to make interventions in tier one, tier two, tier three. And we did that in the early 1990s and the early 2000s. But here's the thing, did racial disproportionality and overplacement stop? It didn't stop, it continued. So what does that say about the, tier, the new tiered system? It's just another box for a lot of teachers to check, to get them in at some point, right? But that was supposed to serve as a break, the pre-referral instructional setting process. And then the effective instruction movement starts in the 1970s and 1980s. So we should actually understand a student's actual characteristics as a learner on, on that particular disability classification. He's saying, finding and adapting, this is Heller, instructional treatments to individual student learning differences and characteristics became the centerpiece of the response to intervention treatment. With treatment meaning the variations in the pace and style of instruction. And again, by the time we get to the 1990s, one of the things that gets argued is that we have allowed too many people without a scientific understanding of education to offer interventions in our schools and in our classrooms. 
And so the return to science is this new movement. And we're going to put this in policy. So all of the existing policies, whether it's IDEA, ESA, Higher Education Act, uh, if it's not evidence-based, it's not good. So it has to be something that's part of everything, not just tiered instruction and RTI, but it should also be part of quality indicators in teacher practice, uh, this whole notion of highly qualified teachers, and certainly and it's part of the science of reading debate right now. If it's not evidence-based, it's not good. That's what they say. So the jury is going to still be out on that because science has made a comeback, a special comeback. I just have this here as a, a brag, uh, part of my brag. So, and I was just waiting for I'm not finished yet. Um, but, I, but, I, but I do want to, uh, and I'm going to open up for Q&A in, in a yes. second. We can't hear you guys. Okay. Oh, we can't hear you guys. Oh, we can't hear you guys. Let me grab it, yeah. I'm actually a mobile lecturer, so Stephanie was playing with me earlier. Say, so I know you're going to start walking around and preaching, so I haven't did this because I'm a little hot in this turtleneck. But um, so the, the, the book and its ability to sort of try to carry this story forward, to connect it to what's going on today, you know, I try to do that, again, to try to historicize the present is hard. But there are some things that I'm looking out for. So one of the things I'm watching in the present moment is this whole notion of dyslexia, because that's part of learning disability. But here's the thing about dyslexia. There are some white parents and some advocates saying that we want that to be its own separate category. Why would they begin to say that? Rebecca Bates, man, how you doing? I just, just caught my eye. How you doing? You doing good? <laughs> Sorry, somebody who I've known for a long time. Um, so why would they want dyslexia to be its own special category? Folks who are, because LD has become what? It's become huge. It has a lot of different people in it that it covers. There are many kinds of learning disabilities. Dyslexia is one, but dyslex dys uh, dyslexia is what? Mainly populated by whom? In a lot of districts. A lot of white students. And where, so what are, who are black and brown LD students? What do they have? What kind of learning challenges do they have? Say it again. I thought I heard it. Just are just straight learning challenges that may not be able to be described, right? They just are there and, and, and say it again. They don't, have a label. they don't necessarily have a label. They could be. And, absolutely. Absolutely. You got to go to a pediatrician. A lot of people are coming up to me and saying, you know, Maze, you need to write something about the pediatricians. They're getting on my damn nerve. <laughs> Because they coming in the school telling the, 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 the principal what to do with the kid, with the child. So it's this whole, but here's the thing I say, the little evidence that I have, there's always been a tension between medical doctors and educators. There's always been that fight and the wrestling over who should be doing what, you know, in the educational space. So the kind of the, the return of the pediatrician is interesting. But dyslexia, if they separate it, they may be trying to separate certain kids out of LD to have its own standalone label. So I'm watching that. I'm also watching what's going to happen to MTSS. Because they said that the tiered system wasn't enough, RTI. We need to have a wraparound approach. So will the wraparound approach make a difference? Some people say yes, some people say no. Then it may not. What else am I watching for? I actually want to know how many students in your level, federal level four schools, what happens to them? So do they go from level two, which is you know maybe a resource room, or are they in a level three program all day? And then if they go to a level four, do they go to the juvenile setting and into prisons. So is there kind of a continuum in that way? So I'm, I'm watching that as well. So the answer to that is yes, but I want to really understand that historically. Um, 
So for the sake of time, I'm going to stop then and maybe open it up for a Q&A. I did have to put this up because History of Education Society, I said, so they say, Keith, come to the conference. I always go to conference. They said, your book is in the mix. So okay. So I'm sitting at the table in the front. And then I was like, I want this shit. <laughs> and then I, I didn't win. I was second. <laughs> I said, wait a minute now, how does this work? And then the person who won, I shouldn't say this, the person who won, you know, she's all up in the, in the, you know, she's part of the conference in a way that I'm not, you know, so I was like, maybe they did this a little buddy-buddy thing, I don't know, but, so man, I didn't play the politics, I didn't play the politics out, so. But, but that's okay, it just, so this is a wonderful award for me to be a finalist for any book award, so I was really proud and thankful for it. So you want to open it up? Yeah. Kind of stop right here. Open it up for questions. Keith, you're number one in my book. Oh, Michael. Uh, that, this is the dean for the College of Education and Human Development. Michael and I, we have a, we have a yeah, give him a round of applause. Because, can I tell him, this is my campus club buddy. That's right. We're over in the bar. We're over there getting that's drinks. That's, that's, that's right. right. <laughs> Appreciate that, Michael. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you. That was incredible. Thank, uh, you. thank you. And I have a question. I don't like the microphone. Um, did you do any research or do you have any stuff about the breakdown of finances per student by labels? Because one of the things that we notice, I am a special education teacher who started out in autism and um, moved to EBD. And when I worked K-5 autism, we had three teachers, seven paras, two OTs, two speech pathologists. And then K-5 EBD was one teacher, two paras that you could never fill. Uh, and so we know what the breakdown of dollars is today, but it's hard to find that number. It is. And, and I don't have the number, but I know that the resources flow to certain disabilities. Autism is one. Dyslexia is another. There may be a few other speech and and and, and learn and yes, those so those were that's where the money is. The money is not in L, uh, ID intellectual disability no. and EBD is not there. And do you know any like historically? I'd be interested of in breaking down when they had like more on like as you were talking before. If there is a breakdown of because that's what it is too. Is it's one thing to say who has a disability, who doesn't, but. Right who's getting the funds because if you're saying my kid's two grades behind then logically he should be getting more funding absolutely than the kid who's doing fine they will say that uh, special education is an unfunded mandate i think the federal government contributes what 15 percent 18 percent yeah and then they say well states you kicking the rest states like we're broke we and we can't do it and but they seemingly find money for certain disabilities, but I don't know much about the finance aspect of it, you know, I just, what I read in journal, in the journal literature, but it's, that's a fascinating thing as well, to see where that money is going, and, and who is it going to, so it's not, it's, that's not a mistake. Anybody who has information on that, that'd be great, yeah, but there's a, another question on it, yeah. Yeah, so, I understand you're a historian, and, um, I appreciated your analysis and the deconstruction of these categories. Um, I'm a linguist, and I was just curious, what input into your analysis might you have, or have you ever thought about the whole thing around black English and, the, and what kids bring to school as speakers and how that marks a student, usually negatively, and a lot of misunderstanding there is around black English until there's been, since the 1960s, a lot of research, uh, evidence-based research. So um, to what ex I just want to hear what your thoughts are about how the language that the kid brings to school marks them, um, because that's their speech community, and they're not in a white, educated speech community necessarily. So that's, that's what I'm thinking about. So black English, or AAVE, African American vernacular, uh, English or Ebonics, whatever you want to call it, is part of the long history of 
African Americans and it's part of a community and the culture it has a history. But when the children showed up to white schools, there were not teachers who were able to teach with it and through it. And this whole notion of, I remember some of the earlier literature around uh, remedial instruction and direct instruction comes out of that moment that said that this kind of direct, the, the direct instruction approach was meant to, it was really meant for kids who were so-called remedial. But it was part of this whole notion that, that the language that they're coming in with uh, is prohibiting their learning. So a lot of the, the research was if we can, we, we can get rid of this kind of vernacular, uh, I think that that would contribute to their, the increasing of their comprehension skills, their, re their reading, and so forth. But also there's something else that's taking place at the same time. There's kind of what we would call a cultural com competency or uh, you know, ways in which anthropologists and sociologists and historians were understanding and studying black language and black culture. And they were saying that we need educators who are coming from these fields to be able to teach the kids and that the teachers need to have some of this literature, some of this understanding. Edu for whatever reason, and this is, this is old, this is before, I know we love people like Gloria Lansing Billings, Latin Billings, and Geneva Gay and all these people, uh, Sonia Nieto, all these folks who come in the 90s. There were a whole bunch of folks in the 70s who said the same thing. Whether it was, I don't know, Willie, William Banks, I mean, all kind of people were out there. Who, was, who, who deplored the fact that schools did not hire people with this expertise. And so we may have lost a generation, and if we really train teachers in a proper way, we may be in a different place now. But I would even argue even in 2024, we still haven't taken that literature seriously. So this entire literature emerges in the late 60s and early 70s that was going to use what the students brought into the classroom and train teachers uh, in how to use the, the language of the community and, and the vernacular. But it, it never really materializes on a large scale because I think the system was resistant to that kind of change, that kind of transformation taking place at that time that was being demanded. And I would say that maybe the system, maybe the system, you told me not to stand on anything, maybe the, maybe the system was a little bit more open in the 90s when Gloria and Geneva uh, really began to educate all of us, you know, whether it was the dream keepers or whatever it was. I think we were open to that conversation, but just a little bit more than we were in the 70s, not much more. So the children are still bringing in the vernacular. So what would you suggest about the vernacular since it's not so the it's not going anywhere, it may be a, the default of a lot of students, but there are ways in which we can use the vernacular to teach back to them. Oh, I'm sorry, there's, so there's, a, there's a microphone already. I'm already like, I'm so going crazy. Because like <laughs> I don't like, to, I talk a lot, but I don't like talking to a lot of people. But I'm um, just kind of speaking to that, because a lot of times we're in danger of conflating how our kids speak. I'm a special education teacher as well. And we conflate that with incompetence, but it's not. And one of the things that I teach my students, um, we teach at a detention center, and it's predominantly students of color. And I explain to them, like, it's, there's a difference between knowing how to play music and knowing how to read it. And you can naturally know how to play. You can naturally speak a certain way and understand certain things. But if you didn't grow up with certain words, then that doesn't negate the fact that you know those words. So like in math, they may not have grown up knowing the word quotient, right? right? But if I say to you, what's 12 divided by 6? They'll know how to do that. Right. But they'll see it on a test, and they'll read those words and automatically think, I don't know this, and they'll skip it. But that does not mean that they don't know how to do it. And so I guess just us as educators understanding, doing the work, our work, to understand how they're speaking, 
Because just like we expect them to understand how we speak, we have a responsibility to also meet them where they are so that they don't feel inferior or they don't feel incompetent Absolutely. in those classes. So. Well said. Thank you for that. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, you want to respond to it? Yeah. P.S. on Peter put a P.S. on that. No, it's okay, it's okay. The issue is, kids who speak a different dialect, and I mean dialect in a scientific sense, not as a negative, are actually either bi-dialectal or multi-dialectal. So if you're hearing someone speak in a certain way, that doesn't say anything about what they know, the standard English that they understand their teachers using and they understand standard English because they're bi-dialectal. They just don't have a speech community that they want to use standard English in except in the school system when it, and, and the second thing is that you, you said is how we speak marks us. It tells a lot about us, our age, where we come from, many different things. And if teachers or educators or the people who make up this stuff um, you know, if, if they're prejudiced to begin with, they're going to hear how someone speaks in a negative way. And then the third point is, there's been a lot of language prejudice in the United States for many things, not just African vernacular. Um, the English only movement was very big in the 1940s, and it still is. We want to be a monolingual country despite the fact that our utility bills are probably in six different languages, you know? So anyway, uh, I'll stop. Yeah, many, many iterations of English-only movements throughout the 20th century. Yeah, it's, it's wild. Yeah, you want, yeah. One more question here? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for um, this information. Um, I'm curious about, because of the special education uh, model, the discrepancy model is, very much based on intellectual tests. Right. And I'd be curious about the historical transformation of intellectual tests mm -hmm. and, and the, the bias that exists within them and that contribution to right. the over-identification of students. Yeah, yeah. so that you, somebody wants to answer, but I'll just say, I'll open by saying that the discrepancy model, and that's okay, no, 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 I like that. Oh, that's right, go to my government. But the discrepancy has been around since the early 20th century. It becomes prominent in the 1970s when they were trying to figure out how to identify people for SLD. And they came up with all kind of complicated formulas to do that. But it's so interesting. I'm fascinated how they are really are pronounced about using a particular kind of a policy and practice to determine who's disabled and then quickly move away from it. So it's still around, but they've moved away from it uh, to a large degree because of our TI. But also, uh, like they've moved away a little bit from IQ scores because discre that discrepancy model was a critique of using, overly using IQ scores in that way. But they both still are with us in ways that have not really uh, changed the, the outcomes of, of placement, uh, unfortunately, although they're trying to make it a little, little bit better. So you, want, you want to respond? Yeah. But you don't need a mic, that's no, right. I just, I, but no, the thing about the intellectual testing, and I'm going to ask you too, in addition mm -hmm. to financing, if that plays in. Mm -hmm. So we're special educators and we give these tests. And before, le don't repeat this to anyway, I'm not trying to get fired. <laughs> Legally, you're only supposed to read certain stuff, but I always tell my kids, remember before we take this test, it's written by an old white dude. Because there's like a picture of a girl on the phone and it says fill in the blank. And it's she talks on the, and one of my our kids goes on the daily. And then I reminded him, old white dude, and he goes on the phone. And so it's not that the kids can't do it, but if you go back to the original IQ test, it was, was written by a literal Nazi who was trying to find ways to keep black kids out of college. And we legally right now cannot change special ed testing unless you can norm it against the special ed tests that exist. So there is no way to take to make a new culturally competent special ed test because it wouldn't compare to the tests that exist. Exactly. And we have questions about mortgages, about model trains, about dad giving you a ride to school if you missed Blacksmith. the bus. Right. Blacksmith. <laughs> like all kinds of stuff that if you didn't 
in all those words, you test out in third grade whether you can read or not. And we can't, as educators, you can't even challenge the system because the law says you can't change an IQ test if it doesn't match an IQ test that exists. Absolutely. So we, what do we do? We, so a whole... We solve that right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I appreciate that. So there's an a, a anti-bias movement around testing in the 70s and 80s. And one of the things they said, they focus on the language of the questions. But one of the things they didn't do was to really attack how these tests were normed. And it doesn't mean, so there's, a, <laughs> there's some folks who are part of the uh, African American uh, uh, Psychological Association who came up with their own tests for black students. And uh, Robert Williams was the guy's name in the 70s. He said that he, his question, so he used the same logic. He said, let's put a question on the test that said, when is Washington's birthday? That's a norm question. But what is assumed by that question? Do you talk about the president, George Washington? He said, I didn't mean the president. I said, I meant Booker T. Washington. When is his birthday? So what he was trying to get us to, he was trying to get at the whole question of, yes, the questions are biased, but the only people who may actually know that may be a black youth audience as opposed to a white one. They wouldn't know that he was referring to book. So I want to just get these as many. Yeah. I'm a single mom of five kids, um, and um, I have five biological children. Three are white, two are um, Mexican American, brown, um, and so I'm I'm seeing these issues in my family. Um, my youngest, I think, is as smart as or smarter than my oldest, but he's being tracked with these tears. I see it now. I didn't see it as tears before because they didn't give me cons consent or give me a chance to sign anything but when I hear you talking about it I see them doing this to him and it's happening this year when he has a white teacher um, my oldest graduated as valedictorian and got a full scholarship to um, a, a local private college here in the Twin Cities and and she's no smarter than he is he's no smarter I mean she is they're the same as far as their intelligence and um, I want to know who's organizing around these issues um, here in the Twin Cities and um, how to get involved. So there are people, so there is a, so I talk about disability rights as being something that was part of the movement for so many de decades in the 20th century, but people are critiquing disability rights and they're saying that it focused too, too much on accessibility, whatever the issues may be. Disability justice is where the movement has gone. Because they say, students are saying that, okay, if you said that I am intellectually disabled or I'm EBD, you've told me that I am and I've had to wear that, that identity for years. So now let me tell you something about my EBD. How am I intellectually, let me tell you about my disability. So students, the student voice is almost absent from not only the IEP process, and I know there's some progressive stuff around IEP trying to put student voices in it, but you know they say parents are involved in it. And, uh, that's debatable how much parent voice is there. Supposed to be by law, but there's not really a student voice. So the grassroots movement that are that may be calling for reform, us that a part that's part of a more of a, a larger disability rights movement. People are saying no, we need to. It, uh, organizing around disability justice and may even call for the A word. What's the A word? Abolish. So people are talking about that, especially racialized disability and especially the high incidence categories, right? And so it's not all of special education, but there are a few groups who are organizing around it. But I'm gonna be honest with you, in the research I accounted very few because it's not like prison reform or abolition of prisons where you have this groundswell movement of different kinds of constituencies. Educational, special education disability doesn't have that grassroots movement yet. And I'm wondering if uh, that's going to ever develop. I suspect that it, that it will, but um, it hasn't developed to the same degree as other movements. But there are people out there organizing around it uh, within the disability justice space. 
I just want, wanted to say I, I am a special education advocate and there are special education ad advocates around here, um, but it's largely run by the white community. Um, I happen to work for an organization called the Multicultural Autism Action Network, which serves families primarily in our immigrant communities. But there are groups like Ed Allies, uh, like our own organization, that are focusing specifically on the issues of communities of color and special education. So that work is happening, but not at a huge scale in Minnesota. There's plenty of room though. Everybody's welcome to join in that effort who's interested. One more, no, that's it? No, no, okay, no, I'm, a, I'm this is the dean here, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do what the dean tell me to do. So thank you, thank, I appreciate you guys, thank you very much. And, yeah, that's, yeah, I oh, thank you. Um, I don't think we've ever had quite such an engaged audience and such an engaged speaker. So thank you so much. The fact that you are all here, you're still here, you're interested, and um, um, well, I know I learned a lot. And I'm going to go buy your book now. <laughs> um, just, I just want to say thank you to all. I'm going to throw out my remarks. Sorry, Mark. Sorry, Linnea. But I'd just like to say thank you to all of you. I'd like to th say thank you to the entire staff of the university libraries and to the Campus Club for such a great partnership. And thank you very much. Um, I'd also like to um, thank um, my colleague, Dr. Rodriguez, who is here tonight. So I'm very happy about that. Thank you. I'm thrilled about the library friends who are here. Um, our chair and president is here. Dr. Lissa, well, not doctor, but Lissa Jones Logren. Thank you very much. Here with, here with her husband, Jonathan, and our former our former chair, Dr. Amelia White, who you can read about all about him in the Minnesota Daily today as he starts his new role in CLA. Um, I'd like to thank all the library friends that are here, all our staff that's here, and all of you who came tonight. You may not be friends now, but we hope you'll um, be friends. Uh, all you have to do is go on our website and read more about our library friends. Um, for anybody who's interested in coming to the libraries, um, I already know some folks who'd like a tour, so I'm going to be talking to Chris, um, who uh, Chris Kiesling is our director for Archives and Special Collections, and um, she, <laughs> she does a fabulous tour, so thank you very much and does a great job. Malika, thank you for coming. It's always good to see you. Malika um, Grant is here, and she um, has the. Um, she will always have my gratitude for chairing a committee uh, that um, helped choose our uh, associate university librarians, and that was no small feat. So thank you, Malika. And I hope you all have a good evening, and most especially thanks to Dr. Keith Mays, who um, is trying in his own way to make the world a better place. So thank you. Thank you.